Hello again, uh, this is Professor Lusheen. This is lecture 23, flammable liquids. Now I know earlier on I was gonna cover some ventilation things as well, but I'm gonna try to limit it to just the flammable liquids content. And then in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about ventilation in storage rooms and in spray booths. Though I'm gonna touch on it here in this lecture, of course. So the, as indicated on the screen here, the two primary um, has associated with flammable liquids are, one is when a vapor cloud is capable of creating explosion. And the deal with an explosion is, tends to have heat, and it, but it's the pressure wave, the pressure, you know, the instantaneous pressure, it damages things and then causes secondary tertiary damage. But then there's also, um, if there's enough of it to sustain a burn, is a, is a fire in itself. So we need to properly, one, know what's there. Labeling should be number one. Safe handling and storage making sure it does stay within its container because a lot of these flammable liquids are volatile. And I know you probably heard that term before, but when it comes to flammable liquids, uh, when a liquid is very volatile, it vaporizes uh, in, in the environment uh, or when it's not contained very readily because it's the vapor that burns, not the liquid that burns. So the liquids natural capability to become vaporized and be within a concentration between the lower explosive limit and the upper explosive limit dictates whether it's going to whether it, it's it's ignitable to um, explode and burn i should say ignite burn possibly explode uh, but we have some liquids that although they give off some vapors at room temperature it would take a lot to get it going. Um, so then we we can institute things like uh, something that aerosolizes it, whether it's a pressure spray or an injection spray. Uh, so when it becomes, you know, it's like forcing it to, to vaporize. So those are safer flammable liquids because we need a mechanical means in order to make it so that it does explode or burst like gasoline. Uh, but then we have other things that just rapidly, you know, evaporate should they be released from their containment. Um, also, liquids that do have that capability uh, tend to put more of something called vapor pressure into whatever device. So if, they, if there is some sort of leak or fracture when it's open, it rapidly releases and could be capable of either igniting or causing an explosion. So the two things that we want to think about when it comes to to uh gas to flammable liquids is flash point and boiling point you know the lower the boiling point the more volatile it is the lower the flash point um the the uh quicker that a release reaches um its ability to ignite that's basically what this means so some things we need to think about for a good program would be control of ignitable sources, of course, proper storage, fire control, which was in a previous lecture, and safe handling. Ultimately, uh, if you know that a liquid once released into the environment, whether it's in a container that you're controlling or being injected into a process or as part of a paint component as you spray and it's volatilized, you want to contain it and you want to possibly vent it, get rid of it. Uh, because if it stays within a, an enclosed place and there's an ignitable source, it could catch fire. The way OSHA breaks down its flammable liquids, as you can see, flash point is on the left, uh, it's the most dominant, and then boiling point is on the bottom. But boiling point only dictates uh, for category A, category B. So the category one is the most flammable. It has the lowest flash point, it has the lowest boiling point, category two, lowest flash point. Um, a little bit higher boiling point, and then we've got categories threes and fours. Now, NFPA has a little bit different system that we're going to look at. So here are some examples here. Ethyl ether. Uh, if you've ever been in chemistry class and had to work with a liquid ether, it, it evaporates very, very quickly. Um, if you get it on your hand, it, it almost, one, it eats away the oils on your hand, but then it evaporates. It's like cold to the touch. Acetone, that's what uh, um, is in fingernail polish. That's a category two. Uh, category three is uh, xylene, which we find, you know, I think that might be categorized in this wide swath called, um, uh, what do they call that, uh, paint remover, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, it, it's it's a, usually a component in paint as well, or it's, it's similar uh, petroleum distillates. And then kerosene, which is used in lanterns and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's... It, 
Uh, it, it can be wicked, and then if you light the wick, it can sustain, but um, it, it's not a highly explosive liquid. I took this from a, uh, a website that talked about flammable liquids. And you can see OSHA labels flammable uh, for the top one. It's category one, it's class A one. You can see here, this is when the flash point is below 34 and the boiling point point is below that is below what it indicates as well and it gives you some examples here uh, category 2 or class 1b the uh, flash point is still below but the boiling point is above uh, either 95 or 100 so we saw that in the the, the chart that was just pre then it shows you some um, examples of uh, what that might be and then here are the category uh, the, the category three, class one C and class two, at the old classifications. So we've got the flash point above and the boiling point. Uh, well, it doesn't matter because the boiling point is the same. It's above, and then we've got xylene here as a category three, naphtha, turpentine. Okay, so that's the classification. So those things typically require either a heating or an aerosolization to become explosive, but they can burn. They, you know, given, given a, a ignitable source, it, it will burn, but we won't get the explosive because it doesn't volatilize as fast as the previous two categories. We've got the category three, but it's a class two. We're getting into diesel fuel, oils, pine tar, stoddard solvent. You see stoddard solvent in uh, parts cleaning solutions. And then we get the final category four, classes uh, 3A and 3B. Uh, you know, these, you know, take, these would likely take a lot more to turn them into what would be considered an explosive cloud, but probably need a mechanical means or some heating in order to reach the capability of uh, burning. Okay, so let's shift gears to ignition sources real quick. Wherever you have flammable liquids that are capable of catching fire or igniting, you should have a no smoking sign and there should be well labeled. That area should be probably vented too. And what I like to say is I like the, the space in which they are in or near to be under negative pressure. We're gonna get into these concepts when we talk about ventilation. Negative pressure means that air is going to be traveling to that space because it's being vented externally. Um, under positive pressure, it would push things out and now allow things in. We want, we don't want these flammable liquid vapors to um, leave the space, and so therefore it's under negative pressure. So it talks about it should also control static electricity. I got a video posted. I'll show you in a little bit about what happens when someone uh, does not ground themselves uh, at a gas tank. Well, at, when they're at a gas station filling their their vehicle, static electricity ignited the vapors coming out of the tank. And they panicked. Uh, make sure <laughs> cutting and welding needs to be kept clear. Hot surfaces, any sort of mechanical or electrical sparks. Lightning is kind of a general, but um, static electricity is a big one. And so you have to do bonding and grounding whenever you're working or storing or handling or transferring as well um, from one container to another uh, flammable liquids. So static electricity, a lot of you have done that like when you're a kid in the wintertime when the air is really, really dry and you put on like wool socks and you've got you know, sweatpants on and a sweater and you run it across the carpet and then you touch something and there's like a little bit of an arc. Um, that's static electricity. So there's, there's a static potential built up due to friction and because there's low humidity in the air, um, it, uh, you're allowed to kind of build that that up. Now when liquid is transferring from one source to another, the liquid flow can actually create a static charge, though very small. Which is why, I don't know if you ever noticed, but like when you uh, insert the nozzle into your car for fueling, it's all metal. It, that's all bonded and grounded to prevent there to be a static charge potential buildup. But if in the winter time you put that in and then you walk away, and let's say you have like a wool sweater on, or a wool coat, and you go back and sit in the car to stay warm and you're moving around, and then you walk back over, you now have a static electrical potential. And so when you get close to grabbing the nozzle again, you'll likely have a little bit of spark or an arc. And as the fuel is going into the tank, vapors are coming back out. Especially as it gets more full and your car is warm, there's gonna be more vapors coming out that are capable of igniting, and that's what you're gonna see in the video. So in the workplace, we're always required to bond and ground all of our uh, metal 
containers. And we should also be careful ourselves to make sure we become part of that circuit as well to make sure we don't have any static buildup. So here's the idea of bonding and grounding. Bonding is just basically an electrical or a, a metal to metal contact between two surfaces. The grounding is an actual line that goes to the ground, the preferred pathway of an electrical charge. And here's just yeah, another way to say it. So when you go into a proper flammable liquid storage room, there should be either lines or a bar that goes all the way around. And then um, the containers that are set up to dispense should be connected to that grounded line. And then you should also have another clamp that when you're going to fill a metal container, you clip, you bond it basically. So there's a clip on the distributing and a, and a clip on the container you're filling to keep them connected. Or there's some sort of um, metal uh, uh, arm that comes out or hose that comes out and you connect it there. So as long as it's, you know, as long as it's all connected, bonded, then that's what you need. So always provide proper or adequate ventilation to reduce the potential for the ignition of flammable vapors. And most flammable vapors have a density greater than air. So they tend to sink. So if you're going to have a uh, flammable liquid ventilation system, what you need to do is probably have it close to the floor, within like 12 inches of the floor, and you want some sort of cross flow in order for it to be collected and removed from that one point. Now, if you have something that's heavier, uh, that tends to be already in a gaseous state, like hydrogen, lighter than air, it'll, it'll, it'll float up. Um, carbon monoxide, I think is right around uh, um, uh, the density of air but it tends to be heated when it comes out, so it does tend to go up. Um, methane, I believe, is lighter than air, so that'll also, but as far as liquids are concerned, it tends to be heavier, because they tend to be chained carbons uh, or um, distillates of petroleum, typically. Some storage fundamentals, you should they should be labeled, you should have safety data sheets. And I've got some products here that I just pulled out of my garage that I'm gonna show you how you can find out what's in it, what the classifications are. You really should keep them in a cool place, cool, either contained or well-ventilated place. Uh, storage must not limit the use of exits, uh, of course, stairways, things like that. You keep flammable liquids away from pathways that you've designated to have people escape, should there be a fire. You don't want it to be like more of a danger, right? Uh, so it says closed metal containers inside cabinets, safety cans inside storage rooms. Here's the picture of a safety can here. I also have some links to uh, videos that will break all these things down. Proof container, not more than five gallon capacity, and we can find that in the OSHA standard. This has got a brass spark arrester to, to prevent there being a uh, igniting source going into the can itself, as you can see. Here's a, here's, a, here's a storage cabinet. So these have a lot of requirements in the OSHA standard. This is under 1910-106. Um, we're gonna look at that real quick. Interesting enough, OSHA doesn't have a safety health topic, safety and health topic page for flammable liquids. So it brings you straight to the standard. So we'll look at that in a moment. Proper labeling, uh, three-point close. Uh, it should be, the, the shelves should be set up so that if it does leak, it leaks backward and down and collects on the, on, on the, in the base. Um, these things should never, these doors should never be left open. Um, they, so they should fail safe close. If you do need to keep them open, they should have a fusible link that will allow it to close should there be any heat in the area. There's just requirements here. So you can't really build your own. Should have fire control. So uh, fire extinguishers, fire suppression systems should be located nearby. When you're transferring, make sure it's a closed loop. <laughs> these are all things I brought up before. These are just smart ways of doing it. Here you can see that uh, even though it is bonded in the picture, it is a metal line coming off. So it already is given its bonding. Here they're showing, okay, so this is going through, this is a hand crank with a, uh, a rubber or plastic hose. So for that one, you would need to bond it. Uh, it talks a little bit about residue. You should store waste flammable liquids in a container and it should be treated just like when we talked about uh, fluorescent light bulbs. A sticker on it as far as when you start filling it. Make sure you aren't combining um, incompatible chemicals, things like that. 
Oh, over on the right, they've got the oily or waste rag. So sometimes when you wipe things down, you're using a uh, flammable liquid to clean things off. It tends to uh, remove or grab onto greasy materials, which is why they use it. Those, uh, those rag cans need to be emptied at the end of every shift. You gotta bring it outside and empty it into a container and it may have to be hauled away by a uh, hazardous waste uh, uh, hazardous waste controller or whatever. Uh, because there are certain types of oils or uh, flammable liquids that will decompose and be exothermic or to say to give off heat. And so there are, there's more than just a few case studies out there in which they didn't remove the, the rags. Uh, somebody came in the next day or after the weekend and they could smell smoke. And when they go to open this can, which is usually a foot activated open, as soon as enough oxygen hits it, it starts on fire. Uh, anything here? Yeah, good housekeeping, good labeling, good ventilation, all these things, and then keep away ignition sources, all these things. So we're just going to quickly go through some spray finishing because it was part of this. So lighting can definitely be an ignition, an ignition source. I don't know, brand new tongue here. Uh, so they should be intrinsically safe, completely enclosed, or UL rated for um, that they won't they don't expose any of their heat or sparking or arcing. You may need to choose respirators because some of these flammable liquids are also hazardous to health. Um, and so it really depends. You have to look and see what's on it and then it'll, it should designate uh, what is required. Every spray booth should have some form of uh, pressure differential device indicating um, basically how used or filled the filter bed is. You got the magna helix on the bottom, um, and then you've got a real basic uh, water uh, manometer on the right. And if you can see the green mark, uh, that probably, there should be a, oh, you see another white one, that should be red actually. Green is usually fresh bed, red usually means time to change it out. And they're usually broken. I mean, when I used to inspect uh, the spray booths, they, uh, their, their manometer used to, usually was busted. <laughs> Here it talks a little bit about how to, when to change out. And I'm going to talk about that in the next uh, lecture. Essentially, you, whenever I see a spray booth, I make sure that uh, they've got a 36 inch clearance all the way around with no flammable stuff there. I check to make sure the lighting is intrinsically safe and no electrical within a certain distance. The uh, spray guns should be uh, interlocked with the ventilation so you can't spray unless the ventilation is on. And then what I do is I create kind of a pseudo grid at the face of the booth and I take air measurements like every few feet and then I write them down and then I average those and make sure it's above 100 feet per second going across it. Or 100 feet per minute or 100 feet per second? 100 feet per minute I think. Uh, but in order to set up your manometer, what you do is you put a clean set of filters up, cover 50% with like cardboard, and then note the, uh, the pressure differential on the manometer. So that's your change out schedule. We used to ask people, when do you change out the filters? Like, uh, well, you obviously didn't know that tip. So the spray application, when you're, you know, spray painting, that's volatilizing an organic vapor. And so it can be um, capable of igniting. So keep things that are ignitable away, for sure. Um, you should clean buildup of, of overspray every so often as well. Actually, your, your spray booth was supposed to have a fire suppression system built into it as well. It talks about stored chemicals. So here's our different, these are different things we're gonna be looking at for spray booths um, in the next lecture. And we're gonna be getting into actually doing calculations for liquid for flammable liquid storage and for spray booths. That's what the whole next lecture is all about. Uh, you can see here, these people are in a spray room, which is why they're completely covered in Tyvek. They've got gloves, they've got full face respirators or pappers with full face or hood. That's what those look like. So, and it's all about just trying to keep the vapor level um, below its ability to explode. So uh, what I wanna do is just share with you real quick uh, something that I went and looked up, I went and downloaded the boiling point and uh, flash point for a bunch of different types of flammable liquids. As you can see, boiling point and flash point tend to be 
highly correlated with each other. So if a liquid has a tendency to be given off, um, its boiling point tends to be along the lines of that. It's just, just want to show you that you, you don't find oddities that are one high, one low. Um, they tend to go up with each other. Another thing I want to look at, if you'll just uh, give me a moment, is so we've got a short amount of things here. I've got a few videos I want you to watch. They're all really good videos to kind of fill in the gaps. Here's 1910-106, and this is all about flammable liquids, but it talks about big storage containers and small storage containers and piping that goes back and forth and things you need to do to try to mitigate it. Talks about the classifications, talks about containment. There's a lot here, and so if you're going to get into this, you're going to want to read that. This is the that chart that we had looked at before. It's table H12 about the size of containers. And I think I'd shown you uh, a citation I wrote up for one of my consultings in which they had a bunch of plastic gas cans, and they were several gallons, and so all of it violated. It talks about out outdoor con con containers and storage and dispensing and gas and stuff like that. So that's kind of interesting. But what I'd like to show you now is um, some things I pulled out of my garage. So I've got two types of starting fluids. You know, why do you have these? Uh, my wife has an old motorcycle that never starts and so I know to remove the air filter and spray some of this in. At least we can get it started. Uh, also used it for my rototiller. Um, that's pretty much all we've used it on before. So, you know, what is, what is, so this stuff is meant to really, you know, ignite immediately and it vaporizes. It's under pressure. I think carbon dioxide is the propellant. Uh, so what is this? I know some people think, oh, it's ether. Is it ether though? If you look, I can, I can't read this stuff at all. These, these cans are old. I don't use this a lot. Uh, but let's look one up, should we? Shall we? So one is a snap instant starting fluid. The other is some by the maker of gunk. So here's what we can do. I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll just pu I'll put in what it says on the thing here. Liquid fire quick starting fluid safety data sheet, SDS, because I need to see what's in it. Got a safety data sheet for, oh, it looks like the, it might be this one, and it's in PDF, so it's preferred. Let's see what we have. So we'll get into safety data sheets in module six. I might have to rearrange some of these things. So let's see what we have here. So we've got a physical hazard, category one, acute, category four, category one for environmental. It's got these symbols here indicating it's an environmental toxic toxin. Um, it's an irritant, acute irritant. Actually, does that mean, yeah, I think it's acute irritant and then it's flammable. What's in it? Heptane. Heptane is 60 to 70%. The balance is pretty much ethane. And then carbon dioxide is the propellant. So heptane, let's see what that is. Uh, I like to use the NIOSH pocket guide. So I'm gonna go heptane NIOSH pocket guide. We'll get into this. I mean, as an, as an industrial hygienist, these are the sort of things I use. So we've got an N-heptane, let's see what it says. I believe it tells you what the classification is. So it tells us the CAS number, that's the chemical number, DOT ID, the formula, IDLH, immediate danger to death, immediate death, immediate danger of life and health, that's what it is, yikes. Regular weight, boiling point is 209, flash point is 25. So we know it's one of the higher categories. It calls it a class 1B because the flash point is below that, but the boiling point is above 100. So it's not ether. Ether we knew was a, was a category one. This would be a category two. What was the other one? The other one was ethane. Let's see what that is. Ethane, NIOSH. Pocket guide. In the workplace, you would already have these. Is ethane a synonym? Yeah, it's not nitroethane.
Hmm, I don't want to go and just pick something because epoxia thing. Oh, I think we saw that. I saw the one, two thing in there. One, two oxibus. What does it classify as? A flammable gas. If it's a flammable gas, then it may just be part of the propellant then and not particularly the liquid. So we'll stick with the heptane. Okay, so you saw that it was a class two. So I got something else too, and that is lighter fluid. We know when we put charcoal on, we spray it on there, and you get a match near it, it, it ignites. So this is highly volatile. But let's see what classification it is. It doesn't actually say on the container what it is. It just says danger. So let's look it up. It just says charcoal. Lighter fluid. Doesn't even have a brand on it. Uh, let's go SDS. That stands for safety data sheet. We'll go with this first one. I don't think it's a Clorox product. Let's see what the main component is. Okay, we got these two symbols here. It's got aspiration toxicity, flammable liquids, category three. It's not very flammable. Petroleum distillates, hydro treated light. Well, let's look it up. Petroleum distillates Nash pocket guide. <laughs> Must be searched a lot. All right. It is a flammable liquid, but what classification did it say? Hmm. It didn't say. I thought it always said. It just says flammable liquid. Well, flashpoint is really low, so it'd have to be a one or a two, but it's not giving us the, oh, the boiling point. Ah, it crosses over. So this must be like a mix of things. So odds are it's a class, I really thought it was gonna be a class three, but uh, no, it volatilizes pretty quick if that's the flash point. Oh, I was gonna show you guys. Upper explosive limit, lower explosive limit. So the air concentration needs to be between these two percentages for it to be able to explode. If it's too, if it's too high, if it's above 5.9, it's too rich. If it's below 1.1, it's too lean. Let's look and see what the other one was. The lower and explosive is 100%. Ooh. What was that again? That's the, oh, that's ethylene oxide. We didn't have that. That stuff will kill you. Heptane? Heptane, what's your lower? Oh, uh, lower is 1.5, high is 6.7. So in a very rich environment, such as in a container, it wouldn't be able to ignite and burn. Um, it needs to be, it's between 1.05 and 6.7. So there's a, a very limited concentration in which something like this could um, explode or ignite. So that's really all I wanted to cover with you. We're at about a 28 minute mark, sorry everybody. But I wanted to really get into the, how you could look things up yourselves and kind of the basic requirements should you have flammable liquids in your workplace or even at home.